from the studios of Foxborough Cable Access, located in the center of Foxborough, Massachusetts, you are watching Around Foxborough. Hello, and welcome to Around Foxborough, the show where we talk about the people, places, and things that make Foxborough the gem of Norfolk County. My name is Mark Rivard, and I am pleased to have as my guest today, Jasmine Grace Marino, who is the founder and director of Jasmine Grace Outreach. Welcome, Jasmine. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Thank you for being on the show. And I also should mention, author of the book, The Diary of Jasmine Grace, Trafficked, Recovered, Redeemed. So with that, I don't want you to give away the book, but tell us a little bit about your story. Yeah, sure. Um, The book came out probably in 2018. Um, because I had been doing this work in the anti-trafficking movement for a few years up until that point. And I always felt like I wanted to write a book, but I didn't know what exactly I wanted it to be. There's a lot lot of survivors that have written books on their stories. And while that was good, um, I didn't want to just write my story. And so I have a little niche in that because what was really interesting about my trafficking experience is that the entire time I was trafficked, I managed to write in my notebooks, in my journals, and I was writing down not the gory, horrific details of the commercial sex trade um, and the fact that I was being you know, prostituted and trafficked, but it was really about the emotional and mental things that I was going through and the deep struggles within. Um, you definitely don't come out of the commercial sex trade unharmed for sure. And I had such deep struggles and I just managed to write down the things I was going through. It was like the only one healthy, good coping skill that I had. And I would hide the notebook so my trafficker couldn't find them. And then years later after my escape and um, being in recovery for about five years, I found out, figured out that I was a survivor of sex trafficking. That's a whole story. Um, and I just you know, started my nonprofit, which was Bags of Hope at the time. Um, and then I just, again, felt led to write the book. And I went back into those old journals. I managed to save them at my parents' house in a big box and went into the journals and would <clears throat> open them up and started a blog. And I would literally write down word for word what I read in the journal on my blog. And I didn't want to leave people completely hopeless and depressed because it is a hard, it is a hard read. You know, there are things in there that aren't comfortable to read and it can be painful. And so I put a present day reflection at the end to let people know that we do get better. We do recover. And I wanted to leave them on a hopeful note and also give them information about trafficking and how it happens and the vulnerabilities and why a lot of victims stay for so long and how the link to substance abuse and trafficking is very closely related. Um, so it wasn't just the you know journal entries, but also present day reflections about recovery and then information, education, red flags, everything is in that book. Um, so it took me about two years to blog all that information. And the reason why I kept going even on the hard days was because women kept Um, emailing me from all across the country saying, I have the same story. Help me, you know, you're giving me hope, you're helping me. How can I exit this life? I can't even believe that there's someone out there that shares the story the same way I do. And so I realized that all my pain was helping somebody else. And so I just kept going and going. And then I finally compiled it into the book and released it in January in honor of National Human Trafficking Awareness Month. And that was in 2018. And so here we are now, all these years later, and we still give out the books. Um, I sell the books every time I speak, and it's also available on Amazon. But the cool thing about it is we always ask for a little bit of a donation when we do public events and people give money. And then we're able to give the books away to women who are in treatment, um, domestic violence, shelters, jails, um, anywhere we can find vulnerable women. The groups that we run, we give them the books. And once the women can read, that story, the light bulbs go on and they say, oh my gosh, that's my story too. And then the healing begins because a lot of women who have been trafficked or through the commercial sex trade don't realize that they're survivors, right? Because they're still in that victim mindset. They're still being victimized most likely um, even at that moment. And so just putting it all together, letting them know that um, there's a better way. And it's so powerful when you can share your story transparently and be authentic, that opens the door for someone else to do the same. So that book has just been a really great thing for survivors and non-survivors to understand the world of anti-trafficking movement. I'm sure it was very hard for you to write that down. I mean, to go through those notes again and relive it, it was therapeutic. And for people who have gone through it themselves to say, hey, wait a minute, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. 
Jasmine proved that it, I, you can, I can be helped. I can get better. I can get out of this is very important. And, and the fact that you're, you know, getting these books out to people for free with donations and everything is even better. Yeah, it's amazing. It's the best part <clears throat> because there's so many women who end up meeting me years later and they say, oh my gosh, you're Jasmine. I read your book when I was in a treatment center. <laughs> and it's so cool that they think like, you know, um, my kids think I'm famous too. It's funny. All I did was self-publish a book. I didn't like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but people like, yeah, we well, wrote a book. They think you're like famous. It's, it's really cool. <laughs> Oh, well, hey, it's being sold on Amazon. So, you know, that it, with your name on it. So, yeah, you're famous. Yeah. 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 Your mom anyway. So you're famous. That's right. <laughs> so, so, you know, I'm sure a lot of people, you know, they say, well, ah, that's not, none of that. That's not going on around Foxborough. That's not going around Norfolk County. It's not going on Massachusetts, but I bet it is. What kind of, what kind of flags, red flags can you to, to know that something like this is going on? Yeah, I mean, it happens everywhere, even in um, rural places, places you would never think it happens. Um, it happens to the girl next door. It also happens to boys and men as well. It's not something that just happens to women. Um, and the reason why it happens, I just want to touch on quickly, is because of the people that it's happening to their vulnerabilities, right? No one wakes up one day and says, I can't wait to be a prostitute. Right, like no little girl dreams of becoming that. That's not something that we aspire to be. But a lot of times, due to early childhood traumatic events, um, a lot of sexual abuse or neglect as children, um, in the average age into the commercial sex trade is between 12 and 14. So if these young kids are getting in really young, um, and they're in the foster care system, just so many things, so many vulnerabilities that can happen, and how we get caught up and trapped into this life because that's exactly what it is. Um, the traffickers pry on your vulnerabilities. They meet you, they check you out, they see how vulnerable you are, how easy are you going to be to manipulate and coerce and brainwash. Um, but then there are also traffickers that kidnap, right, and force you into that life as well. I don't want to say that that doesn't happen either. It does. Maybe not as common, <clears throat> but it certainly does. Um, and so the red flags to look for is if you're especially these days, um, massage parlors are all over the place. They're not going to be American ran. Um, those mostly are gone nowadays. When I was in the commercial sex trade, they, they were American massage parlors um, or brothels, you would call it. But today they're going to be Asian. So you're going to find a lot of shady Asian massage parlors, a lot of foot spas. Um, all you have to do is a quick Google search, look up the number, see if it pops up on any adult websites, even like a Craigslist that are offering, you know, full service massage or any other taglines or, um, you know, saying new women, just anything that's obvious that's saying, you know, it's commercial sex trade. Um, and if they're open past nine, 10 o'clock at night, the shades are always drawn. Maybe they have that neon sign flashing open. Um, you hang out for a little while and there's only men going in, um, not really any other clientele or the women not coming out. Those are clear signs. I mean, trafficking also happens in apartments. You know, traffickers sometimes have women coming in and out of buildings and people have no idea. Um, sometimes, uh, even in my story, my um, trafficker, it didn't have, you know, he, it's very organized, right? So he wasn't alone. So he had other traffickers that he hung out with, you know, consider it like a family. And um, one of the other traffickers in our circle lived in Chestnut Hill in a really nice affluent, expensive area. Like who would think that this man lives here um, with a Range Rover and a BMW in the driveway and about five women living all in the same house. And they're all considered each other's wife-in-laws. And these are all his women that he's prostituting not maybe out of that house, but, you know, they're doing escort parties, they're doing bachelor parties, they're working at massage parlors on the internet. You would have no idea that this man lives there and that's what he's doing. So it can happen anywhere. Um, it doesn't matter. But if you're even close to a young girl today, now the internet has really made the commercial sex trade explode and especially COVID. A lot of things are happening online. And we can't really see it. It's really not as obvious, but there's certain websites and certain apps um, that young girls are going on and they're getting exploited very easily. Obviously, social media is a big risk. You know, traffickers meet the girls on there and they lure them in. And this is the thinking of some young girls that I've spoken to recently is, well, I'm already posting provocative pictures of myself on Instagram. I might as well get paid for it. 
right? So that's an easy in and the traffickers just use that. And there's a certain website, I don't know if you're familiar or have heard, is called OnlyFans. And these young girls are on there and they're, you know, um, taking nudes, you know, they're doing web shows, webcam shows. And the, the guy who wants to watch this has to subscribe to her. So he pays a monthly fee to join and watch her because he's her only fan, right? So you get it. So he pays a subscription mm -hmm. fee and she shows these pictures. But this problem is escalating because now the, the demand, the buyers um, have even more of a close personal personal connection with this girl because it's not just he's not just going to a porn site, right? He's actually her fan. And now he kind of in his mind thinks he knows her. Her. Now he's falling, you know, getting attracted to her more and more. And it's like really deep psychological stuff and is even becoming more dangerous. And that's putting more pressure on her to have more um, pictures or videos or, you know, he constantly will start messaging. Hey, can I have another picture? Can I have another video? Can you send me this? And so the Internet has really um, just exploded with with all this commercial sex trade that's happening behind the scenes we don't see it on the streets anymore right it's not in downtown boston combat zone it's all behind closed doors so it's really hard to spot but you have to watch with your what your kids are doing online you know what you what you're it's just you need to have these conversations and you need to make people aware about this is what's happening and they're hard conversations to have but it has to be it has to be done or it's just going to continue to go rampant and, and it's so quick with online, like you said, with online, with phones and everything, it's kind of hard to keep track of the kids sometimes. You really have to pay attention because you don't know who they're talking to. You have no idea. Is it a friend from school or is it some 40-year-old guy living, you know, two towns over? Correct. And, you know, and they, and they also, I imagine, use drugs to get you hooked to keep you in the sex trafficking trade. Exactly. Um, and for me, I didn't, my trafficker didn't do that for me, but I got addicted to drugs after as a way to cope with all the trauma I had been through. So a lot of girls I've worked with today, women who I work with today, unfortunately, they were addicted before they even met their trafficker because their mother was their first exploiter. So she had a drug addiction. She traded them for the drugs. And so now here's this young girl. Now she's, you know, being exploited at seven, eight, nine years old. Now she's 12 and she's running away and the pimp just scoops her up and she already has a flaming addiction. Right. So try working with those women when they're in their 20s and 30s and been in this life for so long. It is so hard to let them know there is a better way because they don't know a better way and they've been abused from such a young age. They can't trust anyone. They don't believe they have any type of worth and the drugs and all that, how it beats you up. It's really hard. Yeah, that's the life they know. How do you get out of a life you know when that's the only thing you know? Right. Until somebody can show you the way and say, hey, I've been there. This is what you need to do. Yep. And I'm sure there's also violence involved in some cases too, where you know they're afraid to leave because they're going to get hit, maybe get killed. Yeah. You know, it's just, there's just so many crazy people out there that, you know, that's their property and they're going to do anything to protect it and keep them employed. Correct. And it's like domestic violence, but on steroids, right? So just imagine that, you know, all the ways that an abuser uses power and control to control the victim, add the shame and stigma of what the commercial sex trade does. Like just to help you understand, you know, people sometimes say, oh, I'm a high price export or um, women should have a right. And if they want to be sex workers, you know, they kind of like dress it up like, oh, I'm a sex worker and they sell it as empowerment. And this is great. It, the commercial sex trade does nothing but soul damage. It damages deep, deep because you, sex wasn't created to be, you know, just <laughs> bought and sold like that, right? Humans aren't made to be um, enslaved to that type of lifestyle and it does deep soul damage. So yeah, <sighs> so hard. Yeah, I can imagine it must be hard, especially working with people. I mean, you've been through it, but to see, you know, some of these young women come in and, you know, you have to start from scratch with them, basically get them adjusted and start the healing process, which you know from experience is, is a long time. And like you said, you know, you had to, you know, you turn to drugs, some people turn to drugs, some people turn to alcohol, some people just, they don't know how to cope with it. And it's going to take a lot of healing, a lot of time. Yeah. And I mean, and how do you, how do you do that? I mean, how does it, you know, I'm just asking because it's, it's, a, it's a very difficult thing to, to live that life and to 
try to find, like I said before, try to find that new life, the life that you didn't know existed. Right. Um, for me, especially coming out of that life, um, getting hooked on the drugs, that's what I had to stop doing first. Um, you know, so I, I left my trafficker or I escaped from my trafficker um, for the millionth time. You know, I don't want to say I left once and it was all better. I tried to escape from him many, many, many times. Um, but finally, by the last time I did it, um, I got a restraining order. I was able to secure my own apartment, which was like a complete miracle. And I had my own place and I got a restraining order. He left me alone and I got, you know, hanging out with new friends and they were all doing Oxycontin and cocaine. And before I knew it, I, I had this flaming drug addiction that pushed me back into the life of prostitution. I tried to get a normal job like nine to five as a secretary, but I had no support. Right? And that's a big thing. You need the support. You need help. I wasn't even identifying as a sex trafficking victim. I didn't have those terms. Um, and so being, you know, in the, in the commercial sex trade again with a growing drug addiction as my pimp basically for a few years once i finally got out and got clean and sober because that life beats you up even harder um i had to get clean and sober and, and work on that i had to put my life back together one day at a time um found lots of support and help through aa and na um, through that went on to do the 12 steps which is a spiritual program i was searching for my higher power um, a friend took me to a Christian church. And so my faith plays a big role in my healing and my recovery. And so that's where women find their anchor, right? It's either in, you know, an AA or an NA meeting, the community there, a safe support of good people that peers that can relate to you. Um, or some of us find it through faith, right? Whether it, again, be any other faith, but for me, it was the Christian faith and really good, some safe, supportive, amazing people. But for the first five years, I didn't know I was a survivor. Of trafficking. I just knew what had happened to me was horrible and shameful. I didn't talk about it because I was too ashamed. Um, and I just put my life together. And then after a few years in recovery, I got married. And that's when everything started coming out because now I'm in this marriage relationship and I had to be vulnerable and I had to trust this guy. <laughs> and everything was super triggering. And I just couldn't deal. And we had a child. And after that, um, we had to separate because there was a lot of unhealthy, horrible bad things happening in the marriage. And within that separation, that's when all the healing for me came because I sought it, right? I fought after it. I had been sober for over five years. So I had that stability, um, you know, of course made ton tons of mistakes in, in recovery. Um, but at least, you know, I had some stability. I was far enough away from the drugs and just sought the deeper healing and it, and it came and it's written in the book and all that. There's, you know, some great stories in there. Um, but someone told me I was a survivor of trafficking. And once they did, all of a sudden, everything changed. I no longer looked through the lens of a victim, but now as a survivor. And I felt empowered. And that's when I stepped into the anti-trafficking movement and got my first job at a local nonprofit in Boston called My Life, My Choice that mentors at-risk vulnerable girls. And I did that for a good year um, and then started sharing my story publicly. And again, the only reason why I did that early on was because I realized it was helping so many other women. They would come up to me with tears streaming down their face, telling me they had the same story and it was helping them. So that's also healing, right? When you share your story and it helps someone else, that heals you. It's just like this whole full circle thing. Um, and then that's when I started the, the nonprofit ministry. Like I said, we called it Bags of Hope at first because we give out bags that are filled with toiletries to these vulnerable women on the streets and in programs. And um, now we done we run groups, we mentor women, we have about four women on the team who are about five years in recovery themselves, who I've helped empower and, and um, they do a lot of public speaking and it's just been amazing to watch them grow and to pass the baton and have them do things that, you know, are survivor leadership. And so, yeah, I don't know, but the whole thing is healing. That's the whole healing process. It's a journey. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It's not something that happens overnight. Um, I know you were mentioning about AA and NA. I know people have been through the program and even though they're sober and they've been sober for a long time, they still have to, there's a change that comes over that they have to find themselves because they were not themselves. They didn't really know who they were because they were too busy getting drunk, getting high. And they started to change and they started to realize things about themselves. And, and, and it's a long process. It's, it's a lifelong process. You know, nobody heals overnight. Nobody gets better overnight. It only happens in the movies, you know, yeah. on TV shows, you know, 
somebody's an alcoholic, like two days later, they're cured. Oh, it's a miracle. You know, well, it's a TV show. In real life, it's a lifelong process. So I can imagine that it's a, a lot of work, not just for yourself, but also to help all these women start from the beginning and work their way. Yeah. It's an amazing thing. I love it. I'm so grateful that I get to do this work um, and give back like that. And then also teach my children, right? So um, they've been totally educated and made aware very age appropriately from once they were little, you know, about the life that I've lived and where I've come from and how, um, you know, again, I use my faith as a way to say, yeah, how I lived and that was horrible. And I got into bad situations and I was homeless and I was on drugs and, and yes, I was in a bad, unhealthy relationship and but look how much God has, you know, worked in my life and how much better I am today and see how we help women and we turn it all around. So it's, it's, I'm really, really grateful for the life that I have today. It's hard and messy, but I'm grateful. Life is messy, but you know what? You got, you got beautiful kids. That's what you tell them. Hey, look what I got. <laughs> I went through hell, but I came out of it with you guys. Right. Right. It can, it can be done and you keep doing that for everybody else, which is awesome. To be helping all these women and men and children wherever we're going through it. Yep. So that's great. So now's the time if you want to um, let everybody know what your website is, uh, where they can get your book. Go ahead. Yeah, sure. So um, if you know anybody that's in need and there's a woman that needs a little support or someone that's in drug recovery that's been through the commercial sex trade, um, maybe has been prostituted or trafficked, please reach out to us. Um, we, we are still located in Massachusetts. I live in New Hampshire personally now, but I still have um, people who are in Massachusetts doing the work. So the website is jasminegrace.org. Um, you can find out all our information there and contact us there. And the book is also sold on Amazon. And if you'd like to get the book in bulk, if you want to be able to, if you work someplace or if you're um, wanting to give it out to women that you know, please contact me and we can, you know, work out something for a bulk order as well. Um, but thank you for, you know, listening and learning. And um, please, if you have any extra questions or want to have a conversation, please reach out to me. Thank you very much, Jasmine. That was great. And thanks for being on the show. We appreciate yeah. it and getting the word out. Thanks so much for having me. All right. Jasmine Grace Marino, thank you for being on Around Foxborough. And that'll do it for today. Have yourself a great day. <laughs>